afternoon. I'm Nancy Levine, Chair of the Department of Anthropology, and I'd like to thank you all for coming this afternoon for braving Los Angeles' horrendous traffic to attend the 2015 Walter Goldschmidt Anthropology Lecture. The goal of the lecture has been to bring our alumni back to campus to meet and talk with faculty with whom they've worked, to meet the new generation of students, to learn about new developments in the field, and also in particular to celebrate the memory and legacy of Professor Walter Goldschmidt, one of the founders of the Department of Anthropology and who, by virtue of his long tenure on the faculty and his astute guidance in its early years, remains a continuing influence on its mission and development. There is no disputing that our department still today bears the imprint of his influence. Walter Goldschmidt, or as we all knew him, Wally, studied anthropology in the late 1930s and early 1940s at University of California, Berkeley, with the leaders and of the field, the very first anthropologist in the United States. In 1946, he became a faculty member in UCLA's then joint Department of Sociology and Anthropology. He was a major player in creating the new anthropology department when the sociology wings and the anthropology wings took diverged half a century ago. Even after becoming an emeritus professor in 1983, while he continued to teach classes, to meet with graduate students, to guide their dissertations, and facilitate their research. Wally's vision of anthropology was broad and integrative and combined attention to biological, historical, archeological, um, sociolinguistic and social and cultural perspectives and evidence. His own research and writing reflected that vision, although he also focused on the study of the impact of environment and technology on societies, human emotional and behavioral development, social theory, and to great effect, the application of anthropological knowledge and anthropo anthropological theoretical perspectives to practical real world problems. As early as the 1940s, Wally recognized the negative impact of agribusiness on family farming communities and farm workers in the US. For his dissertation, he studied California San Joaquin Valley, and he was able to document the adverse economic and social consequences of large-scale industrial farming. His findings were so controversial and so vigorously opposed by corporate interests that his book was suppressed for several years. However, the correctness of his early conclusions continues to be affirmed even today, and we're increasingly seeing the, the legacy and the continued hidden costs of industrial agriculture. A few years later, he conducted studies of and advocated for indigenous land rights in Alaska. Once at UCLA, Wally began two decades of work among an East African people and led a team project in the region, examining how culture and subsistence affected human development and values. Given the wide regional scope of his research and his broad interests, he was not surprisingly a highly productive writer of books and articles. In fact, he published his last book at the age of 92. While he was also professionally very active, he was president of the American Anthropological Association where he advocated for the greater representation of anthropologists in public policy work. He edited the discipline's flagship journal for five entire years, and he co-founded yet another journal, Ethos, which is the Journal on Psychological Anthropology. He also engaged in public outreach with a radio program entitled Ways of Mankind in the 1950s. We have nothing like that today, a radio program devoted to anthropology. The Goldschmidt Lecture this year will be presented by Professor John Jackson, Dean of the School of Social Policy and Practice at the University of Pennsylvania, who will speak on the place of filmmaking in anthropological theory and practice. I've asked Professor Sherry Ordner, Chair of the Goldschmidt Lecture Committee and the person responsible for bringing Dean Jackson to UCLA this evening to introduce him and his research. Before I do so, May I please ask you to turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate? We're videotaping the lecture so we can put it on our website and hope that you don't take my request badly. So I introduce Sherry Ortner to you. Thank you. <laughs> 
Uh, good afternoon. Um, I also have a public service announcement before I start the introduction, which is that there will be a short Q&A after the lecture. Um, and uh, we have a mic set up over here. So when the lecture is over, I'll invite people to come up uh, and, um, address and raise any questions they want to raise for the speaker to come up to the microphone over here. Thank you. I am thrilled and honored to introduce to you today the 2015 Walter Goldschmidt Lecturer, John L. Jackson, Jr. John is the Richard Perry University Professor at the University of Pennsylvania and also holds professorships in anthropology, communications, Africana studies, and social policy and practice at Penn. He did his bachelor's degree in radio, TV, and film at Howard University, from which he graduated summa cum laude. He did his MA, MPhil, and PhD in anthropology at Columbia University, after which he held a three-year postdoctoral fellowship in the Society of Fellows at Harvard University. He then taught at Duke University before taking up an appointment at the University of Pennsylvania. John has been an enormously productive scholar, having authored or co-authored six books, edited or co-edited four special issues of journals, and produced and or directed and or written seven films. He has also written or co-written a slew of academic articles and a similar slew of pieces for the popular press that I haven't even tried to count. All of the work is situated at the intersection of issues of race, media, and ethnography, and asks questions about how people live their lives amidst the representations that are laid upon them. Thus, in his first ethnography, Harlem World, he explores the ways in which Harlem, as both an imaginary and a very real place, has been and is being transformed by outside forces. But at the same time, he explores with great sensitivity the ways in which Harlemites see themselves, each other, and the community they live in. In the course of all this, we learn a lot about how one brilliant, profound, and also funny anthropologist inhabits an alter ego whom he calls Anthro-Man and, and goes about the work of anthropology. I obviously don't have time to talk about all of his work, but I want to say a few words about his second book, Real Black, Adventures in Racial Sincerity. The book is organized around the distinction between what Lionel Trilling once called authenticity and sincerity a philosophical distinction that allows Jackson to more deeply theorize the core themes of the earlier book. Thus, in the simplest terms, authenticity is all about the projections that people place on each other and that the wider culture and the media place on all of us, while sincerity is about the ways in which people try to think, imagine, and fashion themselves in the context of all those projections. Thus Jackson says at the beginning of Real Black, quote, I want to tell a tale about how people think and feel their identities into palpable everyday existence, especially as such identities operate within a social context that includes so many causal forces beyond their immediate control, unquote. The real of the title, Real Black, is another word for sincerity in this context. And Jackson then works it through a series of chapters, including real fictions, real Harlemites, real bodies, and real Jews, and others, that I list here not to explain the book, but to pique your curiosity. Jackson is an extraordinary ethnographer, both in terms of the ways he listens and records in the field, and the ways he thinks through what he has heard and seen. He is fascinated by the endlessly different ways people mostly but not entirely black people, think about and live race and racialized identities, often in what might strike the outside observer as weird and crazy ways. He is fascinated particularly by the disjunctures between surfaces and interiors, objective appearances and subjective experience, and of course, authenticity and sincerity. 
He is equally drawn by the capacity of ethnography to plumb these disjunctures, to understand, for example, why his friend Bill, selling watermelon chunks on a street corner in Harlem, says that he and his girlfriend are, quote, too sincere, too sincere, and it's killing us, unquote. What, asks Jackson, is this deadly sincerity? And how will ethnography help us answer this question? I could go on exploring what to me are all the powerful and moving aspects of John Jackson's work, but of course, I don't have time. At this point, then, I move into authenticity mode and give you the title of the lecture for today, which is, quote, Thick Depiction, Anxiety, Anthropology, and Film slash Video. Please welcome our 2015 Walter Goldschmidt lecturer, John L. Jackson, Jr. listening to you that I was, wasn't paying attention. Um, so thank you for the invitation, Sherry. Um, I had such a wonderful... <laughs> such a wonderful time um, hanging out a little bit with you all today as well. So I appreciate that. And I'm just surprised you all are out. Like, I'm not sure what you do. It's like 80 degrees outside. <laughs> you all are hardcore. I'm not sure I would be here. Um, so. I, I want to tell you a couple of things. I guess these are disclaimers, but you should just take them as my attempt to contextualize the talk effectively. Um, so the one thing I'm probably not going to do is read. I, I, did, I do have notes that I'm going to try to refer to, but even that I can't promise you will happen. But I'm going to try because I want to cover some material. Um, I also have to tell you, this isn't ethnographic material. So Sherry does such an amazing job, I think, of, of making me feel like I want to aspire to of how you characterize me there. Um, and so there's not, I might try to sprinkle some ethnography in just because you mentioned it, but I wasn't planning to do any ethnographic work. I also never know with a project like this one sort of what's too obvious or straightforward. So I'll try to gauge. The good thing is, when I was in high school, I was a pretty good kid. But the one thing I did that my parents know about that, and they don't get the proof of, I would sneak out of the house at night and run to comedy clubs in Manhattan. Not because I was funny. I'm not funny at all. I wasn't then, I'm not now. But one thing it did allow me to at least begin to pick up was trying to read your audience. So I'm, so I'm going to gauge what's working, what's not working, and try to find a way. Don't, don't worry about that too much. Don't, don't worry about it. In, in fact, we, we can go without the video. It's fine. It's, it's fine either way. I told them they should. One thing I will do is maybe take off the projector just so I don't have to deal with the blue light. Um, and so I think I'm just going to start with a little bit of maybe autobiographical information to ground what I think is the narrative arc for the talk. And really, the arc for the talk begins with the discussion about how I was trained to study film at Howard University in DC. And this is when film kind of wasn't simply a metaphor. So I think now we say film, and it's a metaphor. It wasn't that long ago that when people said film, they meant a photochemical process where you you know, actually exposed the celluloid salts to light. You made sure you did it in a black bag when you changed the magazine. You bound everything up tightly. You sent it off to the lab. You crossed your fingers to make sure you got anything. You waited for it to come back. And there was something about that work as an undergraduate that I found amazing. That the idea of telling stories and images and sound, how do you do that? I loved it from the time I was a young child. But part of what I also realized was that I enjoyed kind of the life of the mind. So as an undergraduate, I decided I wanted to do both. I wanted to be a filmmaker, but I also wanted to be an academic. And I actually got into Columbia, because it just so happened that the year I applied, I had no anthropology background at all. I figured, pretty, figured out pretty late I was either going to go to graduate school instead of coming out here to LA and trying my chance at Hollywood fame. And so what ended up happening, actually, was I got into the anthropology department because they hired someone at the time who was going to be the first person in the department for a long while who focused exclusively on film, film and anthropology. So he said, wow, we have this new faculty person coming in. We have this new prospective graduate student who wants to do film. We can put them together. They can work. That's the only, if they hadn't hired that person, I'm sure they would have said, this is a you know, cool enough kid, but we have nothing. He doesn't fit. But it got me in. 
And as soon as I got to Columbia, one thing I realized was that it was fine for me to do film making as long as I didn't do it while I was a graduate student. Right? I mean, it's clear, right? So there might be something I could do down the line, but my job was to read Marx, Weber, Durkheim, right? to catch up on all that stuff, was to think really about classical contemporary theory and then figure out who I was as a methodologist. I did most of that kind of mostly on your own in, in ad hoc ways, but we tried to sort of formalize it in some way. But that was the job. And I won't go through, I have a whole rigmarole really I could tell you about the fact that Franz Boas, the father of anthropology and you know, the founder of anthropology at Columbia, cursed our department many, many years ago. And periodically the curse manifests itself in dysfunction. And it just so happened that when I got there, the curse had reared its ugly head. It was just a horrible place to be. And so, and in some ways, part of what ended up happening was they had to bring in a whole bunch of folks, including the former speaker, to help fix the place up. When I got there, it got really bad really quickly. And so I was going to leave academia. Not because, I still loved the work. I still enjoyed the idea of being an anthropologist, but it was just such a difficult place to be at the time for a whole bunch of reasons. And so as a way to segue out of the academy, I decided, well, I was going to start making film again. And it just so happened that because I did that, in some ways counterintuitively, but I, maybe I should have recognized it at the time, and by doing that, I meant I went out and started producing film in New York City. So my film community had been, been in DC. So I didn't know any filmmakers really in New York. So I had to find them. Then I had to prove to them that I could actually be responsible for their production. And then we shot. And again, we still shot in film, which is incredibly expensive. Right, that's the other thing we talk about with the democratization of digital media. So this was, so one of the things I shot was a feature length film. And I was the first clip I was going to show you. So I'll narrate what you're not going to see. It's OK. I mean, it's not that good a clip anyway. But um, it's just a trailer for the feature length film I made as a graduate student. That we shot, we, we call it guerrilla filmmaking style. But we shot it all around New York City without permit the first. Uh, you know, never telling anyone beforehand we were going to set up shop. And we shot it in film for about $50,000, which back then was a ton of money. And I mean, still a ton of money. <laughs> and part of what I slowly realized as a producer on that project was it actually put all of the stuff that made me so anxious about being an academic in a more functional perspective. So it was never that deep. Like, so one of the things I learned was you know, one of, what, what, what's happening as an academic is you're being redisciplined not just in the field of study you've chosen to undertake, but also in the ways, often the not quite functional ways in which we learn to understand what it means to be an academician. And one of the things it means is your whole world is supposed to be reducible to your job in the academy, to the life of the mind. Anything else is a distraction, extracurricular. And part of what the filmmaking did is allow me to realize, well, I can enjoy what I'm doing in the academy, but there's still a bigger world that I want to be a part of, and I still want to engage. Because when we would go to the film sets, no one cared about, you know, you know, Durkheim or Freud or you know, the latest version of a critique of you know, Gertzian analysis. What they wanted to know was why the donors weren't there, right? and when were they coming. And, and so what it allowed me to do, actually, what it allowed me to do is come back to Col instead of leaving, come back to Columbia and finish. Because I realized all the stuff that seemed so big wasn't that deep at all. But I had to go out and find it out. But one thing I also realized was even though I might have gotten this enlightened perspective about the academy's relation to the outside world, I couldn't go around telling everyone that I was going to continue to do what I had been doing, which was making movies. Which, so I never stopped. All through our graduate school. And in some ways it helped me, it helped propel me through the program. But I can tell you one person who didn't know at the time that I was making movies. That was my dissertation advisor. Right? And why? Because I think you know, she was really supportive from day one. But I, most folks would have thought, well, if this person's out here making films, he must not really want to be an academic. And I guess he's nice enough. But we can only devote so much time, you know, really, and energy to cultivating scholars. And if this is someone who's going to jump ship and leave the academy, probably not worth all that. So I, so I swore all of my cohort to secrecy. They couldn't tell her. She didn't find out until I came out of the closet, basically, on my postdoc. Um, but part of what I wanted to do was find a way to think about our relationship to film and video 
that really took seriously the idea that we can be academic and also be multimodal, also work in various different platforms and genres and formats. And that's kind of part of what's been defining most of my academic career. And so th there's this, I think, interesting tension between a lot of the ways in which academics would imagine the only way to be a true, authentic scholar is writing journal articles, right, and, and writing book, academic books, not trade books. And this notion that there, sh there is something about the value that I added to a department that was exclusively predicated on the fact that I could teach students to be critical viewers and producers of images and sound. So it's like there was this weird almost schizophrenia in that scenario. So I knew I was getting jobs or job offers because of the film stuff. But there's also film stuff that folks looked on still in a little bit of a skeptical way. They didn't quite know what to do with it. And I was fortunate enough because I had this long postdoc and I love writing that I still continued to write. So I didn't have to fight the battle of whether or not the films would count right, come tenure and promotion. But that was really one of the things I wanted to spend my career thinking about and pushing back against, this idea that only some forms of sort of academic or scholarly representation count as true scholarship, right? And who determines that? And so, so one of the things um, I've been trying to do, and this was, would go to the second clip, is to talk about the specific affordances of visual, digital, film images. And so I was going to show you two clips. So they were going to do two very different things. These, again, these are like a minute each. So the first one was one of these GoPro clips. Anyone knows the GoPro, GoPro film, so any film camera? So what's great about those cameras, of course, is they're incredibly small, they're incredibly mobile. You can do a lot with them. You can hook them up to things and let them do a whole bunch. And part of what I was going to use that to just help thematize explicitly what, and it's a point that's been raised by people like Susan Buckmore. Um, people often will go back to someone like W.J.P. W. Mitchell to talk about this. But this idea that there's something about how we see in and through a video and film camera that's so completely non-human. Right? Remember, the Anthropological Project is about what defines our species being. And there's so much about what we do with the camera that's about how we can't see. The going in reverse, the slow motion, the fast forwards, all, all the stuff that GoPro can do that we imagine simulates some of what we do. Actually, it shows us all the stuff we can't do when we see. Right? So I was going to show you an image of the GoPro on a camera tire going round and round. I don't know if folks have seen that already. And, and the kind of wonderful visual aesthetic imagery that that produces that we wouldn't be able to reproduce ourselves. We wouldn't want to try right, on the tire of that car. And that leads me then to this other discussion, mostly coming out of a figure um, like Walter Benjamin, about what he called the kind of optical unconscious. So that part of what I think the power, and I think the power that I would argue we're also a little bit afraid of um, as academicians, but part of the power of film and video making is it allows us to see things that we haven't been able to see before and taps into what he would have called, I think, a kind of optical unconscious a way of seeing that allows us to see something that otherwise isn't available for viewing. And that, in some ways, allows us to think about ourselves in newfangled ways. And so that's part of what the first two clips were going to get us to do. And I wanted to try to find a way to use that to talk about what I think is the tension between a version of understanding what the stakes are of this conversation that toggles back and forth between two very different, but I think complementary positions. And, and Mitchell, W.J.P. Mitchell is the person who also helped, I think, put a nice fine point on this. That there's a, a way in which our job, I think, as academicians, is to talk about both, both the social construction of visuality, right, of the visual realm. How what we see isn't obvious necessarily a reflection of what is in some ontological absolute sense, but it's a construction of what we've learned to see at a certain level, right? So our eyes, are socially and culturally constituted. But at the very same time, we have to keep that in productive tension with the idea that actually there's something about the way we see that informs the cultural and social world we create. Right? Something about the actual architecture of our physiology, right? the optics of the human body and its possibilities that also informs the kind of cultural life world that we produce. And both of these things are operative at one of the same time. And so part of our job is to figure out, well, how do we make sense of that particular dynamic? 
right? How do we do justice here? And I do think that my job has been to try, even as an ethnographer, to actually think about those two differences, right? The differences between a starting point in cultural constructionism and a starting point in what I would call sort of visual constructionism or something like that. And for me, it really is about part of the same project that's been part of the long history of anthropological engagement with film and filmmaking. And so there is this way in which I think you can really chart this kind of genealogy of filmmakers, both within the field and without, that has people trying to think about accessing this notion of the unconscious, the, op the, the ways of seeing that are so different from how we normally see it enlightens us about something even more profound about who and what we are as a species. Right, and that, everyone from Maya Darren, I think, um, to Bill Morrison, who did a film called The Cajun, that I was also going to show you a little bit, a clip of, um, to Stan Brackett, who plays with the very tactility of the, the actual celluloid itself. And maybe I'll talk about that in a couple seconds as well. But I think there's something in that idea of film being this mode and mechanism that allows us to speak to this fundamental question about who we are as a species that I want to argue, and this is maybe if if I were to boil down the central claim of the talk, I would say that it's this idea that makes academicians, and maybe because we're in the anthropology department, I'm trained as an anthropologist, I'll pick on anthropology particularly, that makes us so, so terrified of the film industry and so skeptical about what it can provide us. And I would even argue so cynical about our capacity to read and make sense. And so what are the ways in which I try to parse that? Well, the first thing I'll say is that there is this sort of wonderful connection between what, in certain philosophical discourses, we call the hegemony of vision, this idea that this, we have this almost fetishization of our ability to see, and that seeing becomes the only part of our sensorium that we privilege. Right? There's something about this notion of seeing that we take very, very seriously. So the other thing I was going to do was show you, let you listen to, show you, let you listen to a couple of different audio ethnographic clips that grad students have made and undergrads made at the University of Pennsylvania over the last few years. And part of what I'm hoping that that can remind us is that when we're talking about film and video, we are talking, again, even including people like Stan Brackett who are literally trying to mess with the very <coughs> physicality, materiality of the celluloid film stock. We're talking not just about images, but any real filmmaker would tell you the film, the most maybe difficult taxing part of making a movie is getting the audio right, getting the sound right. The filmmakers are really, really particular about what you hear. And we're often, as an audience, much less accommodated to bad audio than bad video. Right? We're willing to switch. Right? If somebody has something about that that allows us to imagine that we can embrace the authenticity of the image if it's harder to see. Doesn't quite work often the same way with audio. We can't hear it. We have a very different relationship to what the audio, the filmmaker, is trying um, to project. And so we're going to think about that a little bit to say a couple of things that really ground my notion of thickness and the thick description that is the title of the talk. So I take it, of course, from Gert, who takes it from Gilbert Ryle, who talks a lot about thick description in ethnography. And this, again, whether you're doing interpretive anthropology or not, we know one of the things we own as a field is this notion of thick ethnography. This thick description, we argue, is what separates us from the nearness of journalism, right? Or even the flat-footedness and sort of telescope political machinations of the cultural studies folks. Right? There's a care, ostensibly, we take with the ethnographic data, with the ethnographic project. But we imagine no one does quite the what like we do. Definitely not any sociologist of journalism, right? And so, they, so this idea, though, whether or not you're a follower of Gertz in any strict sense, always gets invoked with this metaphor of thickness. Right? And that idea of thickness, which I realize is so resonant because there's something about the idea of being thick that we know almost seems self-evident right? as a way to talk about the difference between good and bad ethnographic work. That's predicated both in Ryle originally and in Gertz on the thinness the ostensible thinness of the film camera. Right? So, so one of the examples, a little example that Ryle will bring up for what's thick is the film camera. It's because we have the, and again, we know why it's thin, right? 
It thins, ostensibly, he argues, both because it has this sort of really tight, almost claustrophobic quadratic form, right? So there's so much beyond the frame. It's thin because we can only really see it one plane. We, it's thin because we don't know the context around it. And that's why we have such classic films like The Axe Fight, for instance, which actually perform the inadequacy of mere machine. The only reason why we're in business as anthropologists is because you see what you see isn't what you get. That's the Axe Fight punchline. You can watch this 8,000 times. If I can't explain to you what you're seeing, you don't know what's happening. That's my job. Right? And again, and, you know, every discipline has a version of that. Right? Every, so, so we, you know, I'm not the only ones with that issue. I, 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 sometimes I'll, 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 I'll pick on the psychologists and psychoanalysts. You know, if we were self, if, if, so clearly we're opaque to one another. Right? So we can't look into one another's minds and know what we're thinking. We've got to figure it out based on a whole bunch of external cues. Right? If we didn't need that, we wouldn't need psychology. Because we're not even self-transparent. Right? We don't even know what we think we need half the time, or what we believe. And there's, so there's something about the ways in which our fields are operating that really is about all the interesting ways in which we do and don't understand the kind of almost quintessential foibles that define our species being. And so for me, one of those things is the case anthropology made, not from the get-go, but pretty early on that the camera, what you're, what you're able to see with the naked eye and with the camera, can't give you the kind of um, validity, authority, and contextual accuracy that the ethnographer can provide. It's about what you can't necessarily see at all. And so part of what I would use that to do is say, what I would want to do is just push back against that a little bit. And say, actually, if you look at it, from a different angle, part of what I think has always made us so anxious about the film and video camera, right, so suspicious of it, is actually a different kind of version of its fixedness. And so I'll try to, at some point late before I stop, delineate what those issues are, right, what those traits or characteristics are. That actually make it thick, not thin. But it's that pivot, that move from thick to thin that's always been, in some ways, a function of folks making a case for what the film camera cannot do, what it can't capture for you. And for me, that's an important starting point. Because I do know we talk a lot about how difficult, I would even think traumatic it is, to watch visual images, especially, although not even exclusively, images of human beings. Even just opening up even wider, images of living beings of any kind, right? That one of the, one of the ways I know people might not respect them as a film or photograph critic, but I've always been drawn to Roland Barthes' idea and Camera Lucida about the puncture. Right? That, 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 some, that the, the, the power of any photograph, he's talking more photograph than film, and wants to argue maybe that isn't even a puncture for film proper, but there's something about the power of visual images that aren't in any way, shape, or form about what he calls the studio, right? or, the, or the mere sort of observable characteristics that anyone watching or looking at that framed photograph would be able to pick up on. He says, that, that's fine. But what you're actually seeing when you watch, a, when you look at any photograph, he essentially says any photograph of any person, is often not that studium stuff you see it, but what would move you, right, what would prick you, right, um, what would traumatize you in a sense, is what he calls the punk. Part of what he's getting at there is this, and, and it's, a, it's an argument really that's about him trying to make a case for the fact that all photographs, no matter what they're ostensibly of, are really spirit photographs. They're photographs of the dead. And why? Well, he says they're photographs of the dead basically because part of what we're seeing in that moment is the fact that that particular instance of that individual in that place and time no longer exists. So it's this existential reminder of our own mortality. No matter what the image is, he says, that's what the, the photograph is always capturing, right? no matter what the studio might be. And when it captures it at a particular light, right, with a, and again, it's something that the photographer can't even control necessarily. But to capture it in a particular way allows you to see e even more poignantly your own mortality, right? your own death. And there's this sort of wonderful way, so one of the other, only three more things I was going to show you. Um, maybe four. 
One of the other things then I was going to show is that clip from um, there's a film called 12 Monkeys that Bruce Willis was in. It's taken from a much shorter film, La Jete, that really I think is a sort of wonderful example of some of what Bart was trying to get at with the punk film. And it's really just, an, I mean, I don't want to, spoiler alert for those who haven't seen it, but, um, but part of the point of the film is to depict the main character actually being trauma tormented over the course of his life, over the fact that as a child he saw himself die in a bed. In some ways, there's something about this idea of us seeing our own death, right? being able to image it, right? that at least for someone like Bart, is quintessentially important for understanding what it means to think about the power of photography and the power of visual image. So that, so that for me is kind of one of the backdrops. And I also want to argue that this trauma is clearly predicated on several different things. So if I had a chalkboard, I, I'd put them up. The first thing is the idea that really, ultimately, what we're seeing in any film. So, so I was going to show you basically a video of someone staring at us for an extended period of time and just talk over the video of the person staring. But what I would try to highlight when we watch that video is the fact that we realize that one of the differences between, again, this is what I, you can always push back against me in q and unless you feel like you have to stand up and object in the moment, um, that one of the differences between writing a sense and filming is the place of generality. Right? How well one can talk sort of above the specificities of the examples involved. And so what I mean by that is simply the fact that I could write a sentence that says something like the woman was staring at us or the man was walking down the street. And that's just any old man. Maybe I'll say it's a woman who's walking down. Maybe it's a dog that's sort of hopping along the street because it's injured its leg. But the idea is I can say that. And the thought bubble you have in your mind, right? we can do for sure and purse if you want and, and talk about that a little bit. But really, my ultimate point is say that's a very different starting point than the kind of much more dystic relationship the film camera has to any particular man, woman, dog going across the street. Right? There's a way in which when we're writing, we can hover above specificity and particularity in a way you can't quite do with the film camera. Right? The film camera puts you in that place and points you to that particular subject. Period. Because the way in which that move is something actually you can see anthropologists struggle with a lot. And I'll give you just one example, and then struggle in different ways. But one example is a few years ago we brought, um, since it's being videotaped, I'll also try to kind of protect people's uh, anonymity too when I bring up examples. But we brought in a filmmaker from uh, a Northeast University private institution that will not be named. And we asked this person to do two things. That's them to, to give us something to read ahead of time based on the rest of the research. But we had brought them in because we also bring in a lot of people who do filmmaking as academicians. And so we said, would also send us some of your film clips. And so this person gave us a couple of chapters to read and something to watch. And what was so powerful about that was that in the text that we read, and all of this is coming out of a dissertation, in the text that we read, the material was all about the subaltern, and again, I'm trying to be very general, um, the, the sort of subaltern subjects of color that constituted um, the ethnographic foil to her research. I, always, I wasn't even going to say her, but I messed that up. Right? So that's all that was. Right? So what you see is you see this person telling us about these subjects in, in amazing detail, and actually very rich ethnographic representation, and then sort of theoretical scaffolding for that material. But what was really telling was in the filmed version, really what you see is a white male subject who basically clearly seems to be the broker between this filmmaker and these subjects. Now, this white subject isn't in the re readings at all. And, and I don't, and this isn't someone I think trying to misrepresent their relationship to the subject in the field. But there's a way in which you can sort of stage your ethnographic project differently right, with a pen and a blank piece of paper than you can with a film camera that you're trying to use. It takes a lot more work to invisibilize that subject on film in that narrative than it does with the written word. And so that, I think, is just one example of the different kinds of ways in which we have to negotiate a version of 
the, the translation dynamic from writing to filming. Right? There's a way in which it takes a different sensibility and a different set of presuppositions and techniques to do the hiding maneuver. We can do quite easily on the page. Right? You could do that in film, too. But you better be thinking about that in pre-production. You better have that material in, when you're in the editing room, or you can't pull it off. Right? And so that's one of the things, I think, just one example of that kind of connection that actually makes it more difficult to feel like we can stand above the specificity of our material. That's one thing. But the other thing I was going to mention when I showed you the clip of the person staring out, was the fact that when, and then I was going to actually move to um, Eric Garner uh, in Staten Island and just show you that clip for a little bit. Not because I wanted to be gratuitous, because I want to make another point about what you're seeing when you watch an image. Right? So, so one of the things I find most powerful about any film that you watch, and I always tell people, you really haven't watched a film until you've watched it like 55 times. Because you realize by the 53rd time, you're seeing stuff even the filmmakers didn't know they had in their mind. I mean, you're, 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 because now you're looking past the sort of distraction of the upfront narrative to all the other things no one can control, right? That no one could even anticipate would be together in the way that you see. And so, so one of the things I was going to direct you to was, and I wasn't going to play it often over and over again, but I do want to say that one of the versions of I think what makes us so frightened about the film image as academicians is we're used to having much more control, not absolute control, but much more control over what the audiences can see and focus on in, in our world. Right? And so if I showed you an image of, it could be a, you know, a welfare recipient laughing, which is one example that we've used. Okay? I could show you a, uh, an image of the Garner image, which is really powerful. But that any image I would show you, where we stand, we stay on an image long enough, we see someone who's either talking to someone else, gesturing to us, what you realize is there's so many things you can take in and focus on. Because the filmmaker really, really can and cannot control. Right? There are all these techniques you use that you're trained at film school to try to deploy to see if you can rein in some of those meetings. But it ultimately, what you recognize is when you look at that image, part of its thickness, I would argue, comes from the fact that we're seeing so much more than what's the ostensible sort of um, Sort of clearly straightforward narratological impulse of the filmmaker or storyteller trying to give you a tale. Right? You're doing so much more than that. And in a way that, again, makes it so rich, makes it so much more complex. But also for us, I think it's so much more terrifying. Because you realize, in some ways, our job has been to start from zero and to create our story. The story we're solely responsible for. Which, again, in some ways is a second reason why we don't know what to do with film, because we don't quite know how to distinguish between the work you do as the filmmaker who presses a button and moves the camera, or hires someone else to do that, and the author who writes the check. We know the author is writing. Right? We know the author is responsible for those words. But at a certain level, it's the camera right? and the camera technician, but really the camera that captures the image, that does all of that heavy lifting, and especially for folks who imagine themselves not to be visually literate, one of the cases they make is they're not sure what to do with the sort of scholarly value of images that don't seem, or films that don't seem to replicate straightforwardly what we do in journal articles or academic book monographs. Right? Actually, one of the things I'm, we've been doing at Penn is playing with different scholarly formats. And so, our, so the project at the University of Pennsylvania isn't to think about film as a form of public scholarship, which is fine, right? Kind of public intellectualism, which is a lot of the ways in which academics begin to understand what it might mean to mobilize a film camera, right? So they have an idea. They know that if they write a book, especially a scholarly book to get tenure, you know, not many people will read it. So the idea is, well, if I want a wider audience, one of the things I can do is pull out a film camera, right? Turn it into a documentary, right? That's a story that can have a farther reach. That's actually not our project. Our project is to figure out what would it mean to actually produce scholarship, to actually theorize in images and sound for other academics. And actually, for other academics that may not imagine themselves to be visually literate at all, right? which is the way a lot of administrators get off the hook of having to deal with this issue. Now, we've, we've had such a good time at Penn working with the deans and the provosts on this project. And so one of the things maybe I'm most proud of is the fact that even though when I was 
a graduate student, I had to do all of my filmmaking under the cover of darkness. Right? We have a slew of doctoral students all across the campus, in anthropology, in education, in communication, who are working in film in the bright light of day and are talking about film as constitutive of their scholarly identity and who are producing film as they're in fulfillment of the requirement for their PhD degree, which before the crew of academics who got there in 2006 were working on this project had never happened at Penn before. But what did that mean? That demanded we, did a, we do a whole bunch of things, right? We produced white papers that tried to explain to folks why this is important. Um, it meant we had to look and see what other institutions were doing, including UCLA, who had already beaten us to the idea of visual dissertations and visual maps. Like, how, how did they frame it, right? What, are the, what were the best, best practices they used to try to explain to people how they can even begin to adjudicate the quality of these kind of materials? And then we began to create a space where we trained students to think about film in a way that routinized it. Right? So, so the other part of the issue is we all, some of us, and I think most of us, even the people who don't think they enjoy writing, we know we have to take it seriously. Right? There's something about that blank screen, you sitting there with your coffee to the side as you drink that and you that caffeinated jolt, that we respect. Right? Because we know that to do that well is the coin of the realm in this place. And one of the things we wanted to do with our doctoral students at Penn was to get them to really think about using a film camera with the same kind of tactical, routinized sensibility that they use when they approach a pen and a pad or that computer screen. Right? To not be fearful of the difference that writing in images and sound makes versus the way in which we're trained and taught to write conventionally in the academy. And so that, it took a long time. What it took actually was a year and a half. Right? So we had a core group that started, graduate students from all across, campus who were clamoring for this stuff, but often didn't know anything about filmmaking. And then another year-long course, where we did both film history right, in anthropology, but also conventional film history. We did film theory from a whole bunch of spheres, including the theory coming out of anthropology from a whole bunch of folks. Um, and then we also made sure we spent a lot of time on film making and thinking about the ways in which they could begin to incorporate filmmaking into their arsenal in a way that didn't seem in any way exceptional or outstanding vis-a-vis -vis the other ways in which they represent cultural practice. And it took a lot of work. Right? It took a lot of time. And if we were going to have them invest the time in that, we wanted to make sure that it would count. I remember I toured a few years ago with a film that my wife and I did on the history of state violence against Rastafari in Jamaica. And one of the things that happened was at a film festival here in LA, um, there was a junior scholar from a UC uh, university who, was, who had made this incredible film. I won't say what it's about. And I thought it was fantastic. And after the film was shown, he began to tell me about all the ways in which his senior colleagues were telling him it was fantastic he made this movie. And if only it had been a book. If only he had spent all that time crafting a book. Right? If he had done that, Penny would be a dream. So she was like, biting her nails, sweating bullets about whether or not she was going to get tenure, because she knew the film wasn't actually going to count the way the book manuscript version of this was going to count. And, if, and it's that dynamic or that problematic to me that's always been a motivating factor. Because obviously anyone who makes films, especially a film like the one she made, but really any serious filmmaker, knows part of what you're doing is all the research and thinking that, that would go into making the book monograph. And then on top of that, this, and all the aesthetic concerns about, and political and poetic concerns about representation, and then on top of that, an attempt to execute it in terms of thinking about how to use specific images and sound to reproduce a certain response in an audience that captures what you think is most important and dynamic about the subject that you're representing. And that, so, that's, so, so in some ways, it's the book plus. But we, we don't think about it that way in the academy. And part of it, I think, is because our assumption is if you're making a film, you're making it in the same way um, as, a, as an academic, you would be writing a trade book. Right? We also frown on trade books if you're not, if you're not, not already tenured. Right? For the same reason, because we imagine your job isn't to speak to the outside world until after you get tenured. Unless it's Uncle Dean who likes that too, maybe. But your job is to speak to your colleagues. Right? It's to add to the literature in your field. 
And so is there a way we can make films that also add to the literature in our film? And I think we can. And what we've been trying to do is work on ways to really do justice to that idea and to make it stick. The, the fourth thing, I don't know if, maybe I can recap if you can't remember what the other three are, but the fourth thing that I think constitutes the thickness of the camera and the image that it captures is the way in which we can't, in a controlled way, keep the emotion and affect at bay in the same way we can in, in writing. Right? So, so one of the things I would have gone back to in an earlier clip to show you is this fact that we're terrified about both what to do with those emotionalized excesses, right? That often as academicians, our job is to sanitize and domesticate into a kind of scholarly genre and domain. And then on top of that, as if that weren't enough, I think the other part of the issue is we realize that when we're making these films and we're trying to think about ways of understanding what the implications are of the films we're making, we're also hovering very closely to what's always made not just academics, but everyone in the real world, especially the political world, so afraid of the power of the film, right? Which is its propagandistic power. Right? So that's the other thing I think that's really always hovering along, in some ways, because of all the other things that I think make these depictions so thick. Because what they're ostensibly able to do, people might argue, and they might not articulate it this way, but I think it's one of the undercurrents that drive certain responses is that because of the way we can use sound and imagery and affect and emotion of the image, it's much easier for us to bypass your rational, critical faculty for distinguishing the, the wheat from the chaff. Right? The arguments, right, the core, the, the really justifiable claims one's making as an analyst from the way you get moved as a human being manipulated by affect. And so, so we know that you know, politicians use it. This is, kind of par for the course when you're thinking about what the film is supposed to add in good and bad ways to the larger public discourse, is that its power comes from the fact that it we can do this stuff. Again, we can do it in writing, but actually to pull that off in writing takes, again, maybe I wouldn't overstate this, but I think it takes a lot more expertise to do that well and do it quickly in 30 seconds, 15 seconds. They just had a Super Bowl ad, right? 30 seconds, evidently, all these people were crying about this ad. It was so moving. Right? It takes much more time, and I think a different kind of skill set to pull that off in writing than to pull it off with a camera. In some ways, there's something about this, again, I, this is something that I almost retracted as soon as I bring it out there, but there's something about the images of what we see. There are tons I could have showed you, you could have watched, and some of this you wouldn't even have to hear, I guess. You realize, you almost feel like it's intrinsic to the image itself, right? Going back to this notion of the puncture. You look at it and you feel it. You're moved by it. Well, what do you do with that? As an academician, your job isn't necessarily to move people. Right? Certainly isn't to produce propaganda. But I think if we're, if we're serious about really trying to understand in the 21st century that it's completely overrun in this ubiquitous way with all of these viral and mobile and circulating media images, that we're consuming it you know, with every coarse part of our being, right? with every device we own. So one of our jobs is to figure out how do we, as academicians, both make sense of how all of this new technology changes, going back to the core theme of what we do in the field, changes who we are as a species. And this, is, this is uncharted territory for us in terms of the way in which this changes our, the forms of sociality that are operating today the kinds of community we can draw and, and, and produce across time and space, right? And so if that's the case, if that's the context within which we're operating, our job is both to be very careful and critical as analysts of that moment, right? So, the, so, the, so one of the, I wrote a book called Thin Description, and one of the arguments of that book is that to, to really do justice to the contemporary cultural moment is actually do all the stuff that we think of as traditional, conventional, quintessential, thick description ethnography. And to realize that that thickness actually probably has another layer or two that means you're always going to have to be both in the world and online. And thinking about the ways in which you put all of that cultural universe in conversation with one another. Doesn't mean you can go online and exclusively do online media. Now, there are folks who make that argument, right? 
um, Brooklyn Irvine or UCLA, and I think that's probably a fair enough way to think about what's possible. But even if you're understanding what you're doing is simply trying to follow in the tradition of conventional ethnographic research, part of what I think we recognize at this point is there's so much about what we're doing that's always already online in the ether. And it, it's just, it's, it's funny, I, so one of the groups I study ethnographic is a group of African Americans that left Chicago in 1967, first for Liberia, and then by 1969 for what they call Northeast Africa or the modern state of Israel, where they've been ever since that time. And one of the things that just what makes them so interesting to me is that they're incredibly savvy media makers. But actually, because I'm, when I started doing research with them over 10 years ago, you know, I was so, and, I, and really, I do care about the idea of kind of the ethnographic intersubjective exchange and what we can gain, what sparks fly from that context, that I didn't even realize until I spoke to the editor, my editor at the press for the book, I didn't realize it would even make sense to go online and see what was online. And I saw it was only after my first call with my editor when I was trying to explain to her the project, she said, well, yeah, I went online, I saw all this stuff on YouTube. And, and I realized, I should check YouTube for some of this stuff. But not just peripheral things. I would argue everything in my last book, which is you know, 300 some odd pages long, everything is just about in some form, is online. It's either online because based, again, not online the way I package it, but you know the stuff I talk about, the events in history, right, the ways in which they documented all these interesting, fascinating parts of their lives. They put it up, or people connected to them put it up, or critics of theirs put it up, right, and put commentary around it. But to, to really do, I would argue, a good and thorough job of making sense of what this one sort of small, admittedly idiosyncratic revitalization movement means for anthropology and for folks interested in a transnational global landscape in 2015 means you can't study them exclusively offline because they're already online. And the only reason why they're able to keep the far-flung edges of their five continent-wide spiritual community together is because they're so adept at using each other. Because if they didn't use it, they wouldn't be able to exist. And so part of my job, besides following them around in South Africa, and to Israel, of course, where they are, and to Jamaica, and all throughout the state, is also to recognize that part of my ethnographic landscape includes their presence online, includes the images they produce when Whitney Houston and Bobby Brown go to visit them for a sacred visitation, includes the really powerful videos they produce of themselves when they're protesting the Israeli state's attempt to deport them in the 1980s. All this stuff is online. And for them, canonical of their own understanding of how they represent their history and life and culture. And so, so for me, part of what that, I have no idea what time is, but, okay, um, is that one of the things to me, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll close on this note, I think we have about 20 minutes left. Um, one of the things it means, at least, is I feel like our job, and I'll speak to this anthropology department, um, I think one of the things we have to figure out is how to find for ourselves, in a way that works for anthropology, a way of engaging the filming, the digital, the video work on our own terms. I think that's a really important point. Someone like Jay Ruby, I think, makes it really, really well when he says it's a kind of Faustian pact if we imagine we can do film on terms laid out and codified by the tradition of filmmaking industry. It all doesn't work for us. Right? We have to find a way to tweak it, to reconfigure it, so it, it works in service to traditionally anthropological goals. But at the same time, I think the other thing that becomes really important for us is to recognize we can't simply get away with making bad films. Right? So, so, the other, so the, you know, the other knock on anthropology, and you know, it's been great because we brought in a couple of folks, even some folks from out here, Brian Brazil and Chico, who have really placed their emphasis on making high-end, expensive, glossy ethnographic films right, with high production value. Why? Because we wouldn't think about treating the blank page the way traditional, and not all, but some traditional wielders, anthropological wielders of a video camera seem to treat the camera. And I think that becomes a really important thing. If we're going to be serious about it, it means training ourselves, again, using some of the conventional techniques and repertoire of the standard film industry, but actually learning them so that we can figure out how to unlearn them and recalibrate them so they work for us in the anthropological bottom line. And so for me, that's 
always been our focus. I'm, I'm really excited about all the different spaces across the country and the world, actually, where folks are really trying to take this up and work it through. And at Philly, over the last you know, nine years or so, we've made a lot of headway, I think, in trying to understand, at least for the students we have there, how they can be filmmakers, not simply because they want to talk to 8 million people and go viral, because there's no reason except for contingencies of history that we wouldn't take seriously. This is a tool and technique for doing the stuff we've always done in this class. Okay? And not just on the methodological side, i.e. how we capture ethnographic data, but also how we theorize it, how we synthesize it, how we write it and represent it to the audiences who think should learn something from the work that we do. So maybe I'll stop there and say thank you all. Sorry about that. Sorry, I think so. Okay, um, I'm inviting people to come up. We'll have a short Q&A period. Um, Norma, please. And anyone can get up and kind of get in the queue if you want um, so that uh, uh, we can just proceed. Yeah, please, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jackson, for this um, wonderful intervention. It's great to see you, you know, sort of walking around the hallway. Very, very uh, engaging and just amazing. Um, one one thing that that comes to mind is that, you know, um, visual anthropology has traditionally been considered the province of cultural anthropology. Um, but as we look around, we see biological anthropologists taking it up, archaeologists linguistic anthropologists, we have a very strong program here with uh, using video and film. And so it seems that um, in order for us to be able to take up the challenge that you're posing, we're, we're really going to have to sort of dislodge visual studies from within cultural anthropology and to, to be able to let uh, the film lead the way as well. Right, so that people who are doing studies that would be considered maybe more um, empiricist, right, like people who are doing child language acquisition and really looking at close interactions between uh, parents and children, so that those people aren't are able to proceed uh, visually and consider their visuality as theory, as well as those you know that are trying to hold the high production values and and all of these other things that, um, that you're talking about. So if you could just speak on that. Thank you. I guess what I would say is, we're going to go back and forth. I don't think I took the answer. So I guess what I'd say is, um, it's good, it'll work. Um, is I don't think I, I disagree with you at all. Um, I feel like part of what I would, so, I, so I'm, I'm someone who isn't sort of overly doctrinaire necessarily above and beyond what I've offered up today, about how people should use this stuff. Um, I guess my, the thing I think cultural anthropologists can do that other fields could, subfields could also do, and other fields in the academy, if they wanted to, was to make a distinction between sort of filmmaking as a means and filmmaking as part of, a means and part of the end, right? And so I do think that probably will have to mean different things, not just for different subfields, but for different projects. Too, right? I mean, it probably just means thinking in a much more um, sort of, I, I, I would almost say, um, context and situationally specific way about what your project needs vis-a-vis -vis images and sound to produce it. Um, and I think to also build your muscles on it. So one of the reasons why we spent so much time at Penn getting students to work in audio ethnography, because that's even, in some ways, so much more difficult than working in film. Um, especially, because, and for us, we had had this added layer of difficulty where we told them that their grade was predicated on the fact of whether or not a local radio station was going to be willing to broadcast it at the end. If it wasn't broadcast ready, 
well, based on their terms, you couldn't pass the class. And, and not only that, it was, you know, think about University of Pennsylvania, it was the only independent, locally owned black radio station in Philadelphia. So there's one thing to talk about the politics of representation. There's another thing to have students go, like, I don't know if I can do this, right? Especially if the audience isn't just my, my professor and the folks in my class, but it's ostensibly the community I'm representing. And so I mean, it was a, a wonderful, I think, kind of trauma for them to try to get through it. But I think for me, that's so part of what I, I would say is your job, no matter what subfield you're in, is to figure out what you need to sort of build the muscles you need to have around using this stuff well to further the literature and get your project to a point where it's valuable to other people. Thanks, Liam. Um, thanks. My name's Nadine. I said I'm a student in the education department, so the stakes are a little different for me. But I have worked in media and in television, and I wanted to sort of challenge you a little bit about auth uh, authorship and the way in which you um, talk about filmmakers and focus really on the production side, because television and media is such a teamwork and requires a different mode of working on a project than writing. And I wanted to ask you as, as a student sort of to how, how you think about team projects within academia and can we think about visual anthropology in that sense? I mean, I put a, a, that, that's a great question. Thank you, Brother Lee. And I don't think I, I did a good enough job of representing that issue as one of the problems, right? One of the reasons why we don't know what to do with film in the academy because so think about a, a dissertation. It's so much about film that it's simply about the collaboration that's necessary, even with the mobile digital cameras you have, right? And so part of what I think we're also anxious about is the degree to which we can even assign authorship to a single individual. You know, often for most of these projects, it takes so many cooks to make it happen. And so what does that mean for the way in which, again, this romantic sense we have of the lone researcher sort of getting the data and then writing it up in their own individualized manner. I think that's part of what, what the question is. And so one of the things that I, I learned at Howard, and I'll never forget it, I had um, a professor named Alonzo Crawford, who, I mean, remember at the time, all, you know, all of our filmmakers, all of our professors made these really interesting films. And I remember a lot of my colleagues, a lot of the students in the classes with me, we didn't necessarily like this film. You know, we, you know, we were raised on Hollywood, right? This wasn't Hollywood filmmaking, right? I remember we, we, we were in class with Haile Grima when probably his, his sort of most uh, influential film came out, um, Sankofa. And, I, and we, so we were in his, his film directing class that semester. He spent all this time talking about it. He brought in all these cinematographers who were trained, Arthur Joppa and all they were all talking. We saw that film. We said, what? <laughs> what? Uh, you know, it took me a while to figure out so why I would be able to use that and be invested in it later on. At the time, I was like, what is that? But I remember Alonzo Crawford, we'll never forget, we all remember, I remember we watched his film, I think it was um, Walk on White Nails, I think it was called. And he described the process of making the film, we watched the film, and one of the things I'll never forget is he said, for him, the most important aspect of filmmaking, at least the kind of filmmaking he does, and there's a long tradition of Italian neorealism that he's drawing on other things, is when he's gonna make a film, basically he just descends on a community, he trains them how to use all the equipment, Right? They're the actors in the film. It really becomes this communal endeavor for a month, right? a month and a half. They're learning how to edit. They're, and so when it's, when it's done, in some ways for him, the product, the final film, is almost less important than that collaborative process. And, I, and, I, and I've never forgotten that. And it's something that I think has always informed his particular ethic. And I think it's an important way to think about what's to be gained right, from sort of decentering this overly romantic notion of the individualized sort of ethnographic research off on his or her own and completely responsible. Because we're not even, you know, even now we're not responsible for our data, right? It's always been this interesting intersubjective dance, right? And so film, I think, just does a nice job of making that even more explicit and inescapable. And so I think that, that that's a really good point. And part of what we're trying to figure out then is, you know, how do we explain that to the deans and the provosts who want to figure out, well, in what way does this count? 
you know, if you're the director on this project, but another student's the producer and someone else is the cinematographer, like, like how do we fit that into the framework we've used that we think makes sense when we talk about writing? Now, clearly, we collaborate in writing, too. We write books together, we write articles together, right? So all these ways in which we can find sort of interesting sort of counterpoints in that space, but we need to think explicitly about the value that adds, right? Because in some ways, we always talk about how in a contemporary moment, most of the questions we want to ask and answer can't be simply, in any effective way, solved from within one disciplinary silo. Right? The big ones demand this kind of interdisciplinarity we all talk about. And I think there's a way in which filmmaking demands this kind of collaborative social scientific research that we also laud these days, but that film demands we take seriously in a different kind of way. Hi, thank you. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, thank Thank you very much. Uh, I'm visiting from Irvine. My name's Nick Siever. And I have a question about, um, it was great to hear how you sort of recuperated film from being this antagonist to thick description as the quintessential thin descriptor. But I'm thinking of an example that comes up for me often, which is that for in Goethe's, in that essay, the sort of villain against thick description is not film, but confidential analysis and sort of formalism, American formalism, post-war stuff, of which you might see, you know, I'd, so I've sort of in, a sort of uh, inappropriate analogical question, which is to sort of speculate on if you could recuperate film as something that might be interesting for anthropological work, what might you do for what I see as sort of the descendants of a lot of this formalist analysis, which would be sort of contemporary online data science behaviorist -y kind of uh, collections of data, which do similar things in terms of, you know, you can't, uh, in terms of claiming to represent exactly what they have, you know, you can't decide what's necessarily in frame all the time, but sometimes you can. Uh, some of those realism questions. And so I guess I'm curious about that. That's a great question. Um, and I, I, I never have a great answer, but I really won't have a great answer for that one. Um, I mean, I, I guess my, my first response is to say, you know, I'd be invested in trying to find a way to recuperate and privilege a kind of mathematical anthropology in that context. There's a way to get to, to sort of problematize some of the taken for granted notions of that inform some of these sort of formalist techniques and epistemology. So that would be the job. So I think if, so I, so I think it means two things. It means becoming versed in the terms that are used, right, the terms of art and craft in those spheres, but also bringing that kind of anthropological, critical, analytic to bear on the ways in which it doesn't allow us to escape any of the other kind of culturalist, masquerading as universalist, frameworks that I think a lot of this stuff also, I think, can be strategically crafted. One of the things I, I'm, I'm trying to work on now, and I'm, I'm going to probably finish it. I don't know when I'm going to finish it now, actually. Um, but it's to try to do a critique of these, the sort of, the sort of complete, I would argue, unchallenged hegemony of um, random control tests, right? Random control tests. And there's something about that model. Clearly, we imagine that's the gold standard, right? That's it. And there might be a way, again, it may be a small way, who knows how much traction it'll get, for the kind of anthropological interrogator to actually explain to folks how and why the random control trial doesn't get at all the stuff we would imagine it allows us to do vis-a-vis -vis understanding the complicated nature of social and cultural worlds, right, in situ, right, in the world. And so for me, it's about just making sure we don't simply sort of wall ourselves off from that debate, but to engage in a way that actually brings the anthropological perspective in a way that's understandable to these folks into the conversation, hopefully get people to think about the implication with some of the stuff they've been taking for granted for a long time. Thanks, that's a great question. Again, so it's the best. Answers are hard. Um, I'm waiting. There we go. Hi, I'm Jessica Catalino here in anthropology at UCLA. and. Um, one of the things I've always admired about your work was your insistence at simultaneously operating um, in, in very seemingly different registers. Um, so, for example, or levels, we could also say, um, your insistence on thinking about representation and mediation and intersubjectivity all within a frame of analysis together, um, and political economy you've always brought in. And so I wanted to bring in a little bit more of the kind of plain old institutional or political economic um, question to 
what you're talking about in terms of a kind of certifying of knowledge um, at Penn that you've been doing and ask just a really basic question, which is at the level of the discipline, say, at the level of the AAA, um, on the board of the Society for Cultural Anthropology, as I think you know, um, people have been talking about what it would mean for the professional societies to weigh in so that departments across the country could feel comfortable about some kinds of standards or ideas about other genre, um, and film in particular, for things like the PhD or tenure. Um, and here at the University of California, we have our open access policy now um, across the UC system that has forced us to really be talking about um, access and the circulation of knowledge and also the kind of production of knowledge and what role institutions like a major university system have in this. So I've really appreciated the, the way you've tacked back and forth between you know, talking about film theory, um, talking about ethnography, and talking about what you're doing at Penn. And I was just wondering what thoughts you have for other institutional contexts, um, you know, aside from the individual filmmaker or the a university. What about the university, the profession, um, the library, et cetera, would you bring to bear on this? Thanks, Jessica. So I guess the, the end, I mean, I don't think this is going to be particularly satisfying. But one of the ways in which I think about this is to say that there are really only two options for the academy right, as an institution on this particular matter. One is to go in, and it's the same end point, I would argue. It's the same finish line. The issue is, do we go to that self-same finish line kicking and screaming? Right? Um, and backing into it? Or do we think purposefully and proactively about how to in incorporate the stuff that will inevitably be what we do? Right? So, so again, this could be five years, it can be 15 years, it could be 50 years. This is where we're headed. I don't think I have to be you know, a, 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 a fortune teller, a future. I mean, I, clearly this is, I think, I was a little too forceful. I think, I think they use it to, to you know, pull me, rein me in a little bit when I go there. Um, is, is, so I think, so our project really is to say, and I think people get it. Like, once you, like, you can see what's going on around us, and you know, we don't even know where we're going. Like, I mean, but it's clear the direction we're headed. And so I think part of the way in which we've been able to get people to think about this at Penn is, let's make sure we're going into that future thinking purposely about what's the best road to get there. And I think that's the key, is, is we can choose any of those. And some institutions won't be willing to do that. They'll end up in the same place anyway. right? And they'll then have to rely on the people who actually had the foresight to really think through it. But I do feel like that, for me, it's comforting in a way, because I feel like no matter what happens, I think pretty much that there's a telos here in terms of how we're using all this. And I don't even know what the next you know, level of this is, right? We can't even anticipate it, right? Our science fiction writers can't even necessarily predict it. But I think that's, for me, what's the most important organizing principle for how institutions should be thinking about this, which is it really is in their best interest to get ahead of this and to think how can they incorporate in a way that really impacts the research, the scholarship, the teaching of their faculty and their students. Because folks want it, and because that's, in some ways, exactly what defines the contemporary cultural landscape. And anything else, I think, is either being myopic, myopic or narrow-minded or just completely ignorant about the extent to which we're, always, we're already there and we're always dealing with this stuff as it is. And so that, that for me, is, is something that at least has worked as a rhetorical gesture vis-a-vis -vis the folks we talk to um, at Penn. And even if it doesn't work, honestly, I, I would pretty much stake everything I have on the fact that we're all going in the same direction. And so it might take longer if folks don't get on the train early, but I think it happens no matter what. Well, thank you very, very much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.